Hello everybody, this is Brother Luke, Sin City Preacher. Welcome to this episode of Bible Talk with Brother Luke. Today I'm continuing my conversations with Brother Jason Jack, and we're doing a series, uh, 101 Verses Proving Faith Alone. Uh, we've done quite a few uh, videos already. We're, uh, I think on verse number 51 or 52 on our list. So if you haven't seen the the previous videos on this subject, uh, I hope you will go back and watch this from the beginning. Uh, those videos are available on my YouTube channel, Sin City Preacher. Uh, and not only I think will this series be helpful to you to comfort you and give you that blessed assurance and confidence that uh, the doctrine of salvation by grace alone through faith alone in Christ alone is, is the true gospel, but also uh, this series can be helpful to you to, to give to somebody else who may not understand this. Uh, so, Brother Jason Jack, uh, glad you could join me again today. You want to say anything before we get started? Ready to do another video. Thanks for having me. All right, brother. Okay, I think the next one we're on is uh, Hebrews uh, chapter 4. Oops, i got to paste this into the Bible gateway here. Hebrews chapter 4, verses 9 and 10. So it says, There remaineth therefore a rest to the people of God. For he that is entered into his rest, he also hath ceased from his own works, as God did from his. Hmm. It's a beautiful, beautiful idea, beautiful concept. Uh, brother, as usual, go, go ahead, teach us. Phrases that 
you like and somebody that will say that easy, believe, easy believism is a, a license to sin, but really it's a license to rest. And this is exactly what this passage is talking about. Yes, exactly. This is a perfect verse to make the point. Um, I, I don't want to take uh, credit for that saying. Uh, that's uh, Brother Ronnie. His uh, YouTube channel was Hood Minister or Saint Hood. He has, I think he changed his channel name for that. But uh, it's uh, he. He's always been one of my favorite YouTubers. In that, not by not that he produces videos, but when he makes a comment. Uh, it's he is very gifted at, at writing and uh, expressing himself with a written word. And you know, uh, when I read his writing, it's almost like I'm reading scriptures, and I'm just so blessed by the, the inspiration of it. But he he came up with this simple saying, so I wanted him to get credit for that. And we have a license to rest. Uh, so the people who feel that they like they're under all this pressure. Oh man, I'm, I'm hoping I'm doing enough works. I'm, I hope that uh, I'm doing the right works, and, and I hope that God will judge me good enough. And and they're never they're never at peace. They don't have the joy that that we have uh, they, because they don't have this assurance. Um, and this, they're not certain they're going to go to heaven because they're always thinking that it's it, it'll be determined by how much work they did and how good they were able to become um, but you viewers uh, you, you have the license to rest you have the right to rest you just imagine that Jesus uh, is, is reaching out to you and you you embrace him and he's 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 got his arms around you and you're just resting on his bosom kind of like uh, I think that at the the Last Supper I think there's a, a, a verse there that talks about uh, John resting on his uh, the bosom of Jesus. Uh, maybe you can re recall a verse like that for me, brother. But uh, uh, just a, what a wonderful feeling to, to be able to rest and know that uh, my salvation is not contingent upon my ability to, to, to be good and to, to behave. And, and uh, it, it, it's already settled and it's, and it's, it's certain and it's irreversible. Is irrevocable. I'm going to go to heaven because Jesus has me in his arms and he'll never let go of me. So uh, it's just a wonderful feeling to, to have this uh, rest and, and not feel burdened that we've got to work at salvation. Um, I That verse 11, I'm glad that you, I don't know if you were just familiar with that verse and you knew it was there or you happened to look ahead, but that is, I just find that very humorous. Uh, let us labor, therefore, to enter into that rest. Uh, and it, it is, it is kind of funny how um, uh, some people will um, label us and, and with this uh, term uh, "easy believism," and they uh, they they use it as a pejorative. I made a video titled "Easy Believism," and I, and I say that I, I'll wear that that title, Easy Believism. I'll wear it in a crown or a badge, uh, and, and I'm, I'm proud to say that, yes, that, that is what I believe. Salvation, as we said in our last session, we talked about my yoke is easy, my burden is light. Uh, it is easy to get saved, to get connected to God, and, and, uh, and have this assurance of salvation. It's easy. We just trust that Jesus has the ability to save us, Jesus did everything that was needed for our salvation. Jesus promises us we're going to go to heaven and we'll just trust him completely. And, uh, and he, he is faithful to keep his promise. And when we, when we understand that, then we, we, we should know that, yeah, it, it is easy. Um, uh, but this labor to enter the rest um, it sounds like a kind of an oxymoron, opposing ideas, but I've always said this about the, the people who challenge easy believism. They, they, they say, well, it's just easy believism. Well, for, for those people who don't understand and accept salvation is easy, 
then uh, I would say it, it is not easy for that, is it? It's very hard. It's, it's, it's impossible. They just cannot accept the fact that salvation will not be determined by their own merit. And so it's, it's, it's hard for them. But it's, it's easy for us to accept the gift. mentioned earlier uh, uh, you, uh, the Apostle Paul uh, as the, the writer of this book, and I agree with you, uh, but there is a debate over the authorship uh, of this, um, and um, I'm sure that there are from some very scholarly people who disagree with us and think someone else wrote it, but I believe Paul wrote it, and I, I look at this as kind of a sequel to uh, the book of Galatians, where Paul is, uh, has the task of telling the Jewish believers, look, uh, you need to leave religion out of this. Uh, you're, you're, you're teaching that you have to become a, a religious Jew, follow uh, you know, the, the Mosaic laws, circumcision, the Sabbath, dietary laws, temple worship, animals, even animal sacrifices are covered here in Hebrews. They're, they're saying that you've got to convert to a Jew and do all be do this Jewish religion and and believe in Jesus. And that, that's really no different than all the Lordship, salvation, and probably 95% of all um, Christendom today in the world. Uh, all those people who identify themselves as some kind of a Christian, almost all of them believe that uh, it's faith in Jesus and being religious. And so Paul... Uh, tells us in Galatians and in Hebrews that all these tenets of, of Judaism have to be discarded. And whether it's the tenet of Judaism or any other religious uh, practice, uh, a good example would be uh, Roman Catholicism, all the religious things that they do, um, you, you, you just need to discard that um, and, and, and have no faith in that. But put your faith entirely in, in Jesus instead. So that's really what uh, the book is about. It's written to Hebrews. Uh, there are the the Paulonius. They they 
the, the Paul Onlyus, um, they have a, in a way, I'm a little bit jealous of them because their, their job is so easy. Um, uh, all it, anytime there's a difficult passage that a Lordship Salvation will twist to support their, their false doctrine, uh, the, the, the Paul Onlyist, uh, their, their answer is, well, that's not to the church. That's to the Jews and to Israel and, you know, um, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John and, and, and Hebrews and James, all these things. Don't even worry about that because just stick with what Paul said. So isn't it easy to just dis dismiss all the others? And that, that, boy, that's an easy way out of all the problem texts. Uh, but, uh, I believe that, uh, uh, Hebrews, uh, is, is also for the church, even though it's addressed to the Hebrews, it's addressed to the Hebrew believers. The first believers were, were the Jewish people. And, and many of these Jewish people, uh, they understood that, uh, uh, correctly and, and their faith was in, Je was in Jesus. But then the Judaizers, uh, were kept coming to Paul's churches and saying, uh, Paul's misled you. Uh, you, you, you can't give up Judaism. You must also practice Judaism. Uh, Acts 15 verse 1 says, you can't be saved unless you're circumcised. You know? So this, uh, there's, this is an argument in the beginnings of the church, uh, that went on for quite a, quite a while about what is the role of Judaism? Is there any place for uh, practicing Judaism in Christianity? So, uh, um, Paul, I believe, wrote this book, as you said. He wrote it to the Hebrew believers because even though many of them, they believed correctly, but they felt under peer pressure to, to continue doing the, all the Jewish things, uh, going to the temple and doing the animal sacrifices. That's what the book of Hebrew is really uh, really addressing. Uh, and, and they're told here, you've got to discard that too. You know, not only circumcision and uh, dietary laws, but even the animal sacrifices because uh, Jesus' sacrifice on the cross uh, accomplished everything. And the other sacrifices we did in, in Judaism, uh, that was just a, a picture of the, the, the sacrifice of Jesus that was, was to come. Um, there's a, we could go on and on talking about the book of Hebrews and, and all this, uh, for hours, but I, I'd like to get back to actually some of the points in these verses here, but I don't want to take over the conversation here. So let me get your thoughts on what I just said here, and then I, I have a few other things I'd like to say before we move to the next verses. Get 
back into doing anything that these people are trying to get you to do, that those works, never part of salvation, look forward, uh, look at the cross, look at what he did, don't go back and try to establish your own righteousness. Mm -hmm. um, th th these verses here, to me, there is so much in this. these two or three verses, if we include verse 11, there's so much in there that uh, I feel you could probably write a book just about these three verses here, brother. I mean, you know, you already wrote one book, but I, I believe that there's, there's there's enough that could be said about these three verses that we could actually make a book. But uh, um, I, I let me just cover a couple of points that I think have really uh, kind of blow me away. It says, uh, "For for he that enter that is entered into his rest." That's you and I, you and I have entered into his rest. Now, we're not under any pressure to be religious in any way. There's nothing we feel obligated to do uh, religiously. So we can just relax and enjoy our salvation. It says, now he also hath ceased from his own works. Uh, that's talking about you and me. Uh, as God did from his. So uh, I think... You know, I've never really tried to really, uh, uh, you know, study this particular verse before. Uh, but I, I think this is talking about how Jesus on the cross says it is finished. And, you know, his work is over too. The work that was needed for our salvation, Jesus did it. And then he said it's finished. And he's not continuing to work in order for, for, to keep us saved either. And it, it's like it says in Hebrews talking about he's, he's not being crucified over and over and over again. It, 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 one crucifixion and one death was enough. So now he's resting from the work for our salvation. We should be able to rest too. And then it says, well, let, let us labor therefore. Now, as I said, it should be so easy just to accept this free gift and enjoy it. But it's hard for people to accept the concept that salvation is not based on personal merit. Our human pride enters into it. We can't, we, 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 almost automatically think, well, that's too good to be true. You know, you mean you're going to go to heaven? Not no matter how good or bad you are, but just based upon believing in Jesus? That's too good to be true. That's too easy. Well, labor, would you labor? Would you work at believing on that? Because <laughs> apparently it's pretty hard for you to accept this simple truth that it's a free gift. So, uh uh, yeah, some people have to really labor at it, but for for me, I was just happy to believe it and accept it and receive the gift. And he says, lest any man fall after the same example of unbelief. And that's uh, that's referencing the, uh, uh, I, I think, if we look at the Amplified, that, I noticed that amp, uh, talks about that uh, in the wilderness. Uh, let me read the whole thing in the Amplified and then get your thoughts on this again. Uh, it says, so there remains a full and complete Sabbath rest for the people of God. For the one who has once entered his rest has also rested from the weariness and pain of his human labors, just as God rested from those labors uniquely his own. Let us therefore make every effort to enter that rest of, of God, to know and experience it for ourselves, so that no one will fall by following the same example of disobedience as those who died in the wilderness. Now, I haven't read the whole chapter, but you mentioned earlier that I guess earlier in the chapter, it's uh, referencing the, the Jews in the wilderness. So, all right. What are your, what's your response to all that?
entire discussion of these verses, I kind of held this thought back till the end. But I, I've, all, I've been thinking all along is that, uh, it, in a way, it's, it's a contradiction, but, but not really. And that is that right now, you're doing a work, and I'm doing a work. This is a ministry that we're working at. A ministry, uh, the Bible teaches us that when we believe in Jesus, we're born again as a child of God, and then it says, "Now your work begins not not to not to get saved, but because you get now you get the honor and privilege of, of serving God and your fellow man." Uh, so it's it's a it's a privilege to be able to do these works of uh, ministry. Just means service. So we we get to serve our fellow man. We get to serve God. It's a privilege, but. It is technically a religious work that we're doing. But but I'm not doing this work to gain salvation. I'm not doing this work so that I keep my salvation and for fear I might lose it if I don't work. Uh, and, and I'm certainly not doing it to prove it to anybody else. That, look, I must truly be saved because look how I'm working in my ministry. <laughs> no, I'm doing it because it's a privilege and it's a great uh, a love. It's a... It's a a labor of love uh, to be able to uh, have fellowship with you, to, uh, to to know to know even uh, there's a one of my YouTube channels I recommend uh, on my channel. Uh, got it now. I forgot his name. I'll think of it in a minute. But he he grew up and it's a Jewish uh, uh, studying to be a rabbi and and uh, and uh, he he. he teaches a lot with a Jewish uh, perspective to everything. And so he was very good. But but uh, uh, he said one time in one of his videos, he says, if you are fortunate enough to know one or two Christians in your whole life that, one, understand the gospel correctly as we do, and two, that that are easy to get along with and you have fellowship because they don't want to argue and divide over all all these minor doctrines, always trying to nitpick each other, you know? So you're someone like that. And, and, and there's only a handful of Christians I've known in my life. In 31 years, I've only can think of a handful that uh, believe correctly for salvation and will give me the liberty uh, to we, that we don't have to agree on everything else. We, we, we can have these conversations. Uh, and so... Um, uh, it, it's really a, a pleasure. The point I'm getting back to is that it's a, a pleasure to be able to talk about Jesus. It's not a work where, oh gosh, oh no, you mean tonight I got to make a video? And, man, I better study and take my notes and I really work at this and, you know, I just, just sweat over it. No. no, it's a pleasure to talk about Jesus and the Bible with a brother. Amen. All right, brother. Uh, and, and, and I just want to make sure people understand this, that you're going to be able to do that a lot better and a lot more efficiently, efficiently by resting in God's grace than putting in the yoke of the law and trying to follow all these rules and say, oh, I need to do this. I need to make sure that, you know, 
I get a video out and you know, on YouTube like we are or doing this. No, it's a pleasure to do it. You know, there's no, um, even though it takes time and effort to do it, it is sometimes effortless in, um, in doing it because you're resting God's grace. You're allowing him to, to guide you and help you and think, you know, I'm not saying that it's easy to, to do um, ministry work. Sometimes it is a labor of love, but that love gets you through um, where you're always, you know, seeing the, the light literally uh, at the end of the tunnel. And, um, you know, it, it's always uh, like with these conversations, very enjoyable. When we uh, talked about uh, Matthew 11, uh, 28 through 30, you know, my yoke is easy, my burden is light. I think we can look at that in a discipleship standpoint, too. You know, if you're trying to, um, you know, do all these religious works and feel like that's part of salvation, and if you don't do this or this or this or lead a Christian life that you could lose your salvation or something like that, it's going to become so hard and you're going to be stressed out. You're going to be, you know, overburdened. Um, but if you rest in God's grace and know that it's not anything that you do for salvation, it's what you did and just trust in his finished work, then you can go on unto a really good, enjoyable discipleship throughout your lifetime with some ups and downs as everybody will have. But overall, that discipleship will, the burden of it will be light and that yoke will be easy because you're depending on Jesus to guide you and help you along the way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the... Uh... Uh, the other uh, YouTube channel that I was trying to think of, the, it's, I have a on the right hand column of my uh, homepage uh, on YouTube, it says I recommend these channels, and uh, I have uh, Jack Smack Seven Seven, I have Jason Jack, I have Renee Rowan, I have For the Most High Jesus, and the next one is Aaron Budgen. Aaron Budgen is the uh, the one that uh, uh, I was trying to remember his name for some reason, but uh, uh, he came to the same conclusion um, that uh, it's so hard to find people who believe correctly on salvation. And then when you do, I can't tell you how many brothers and sisters I've had here on YouTube that we're, we're enjoying our fellowship. And then there comes a point where we we're no longer even friends just because they, they, they don't like my opinion on something else. You know, uh, and nothing to do with with the the core doctrines of Christianity. It, it, it's just a minor a minor theological subject of disagreement, and then they can't tolerate it. So Aaron Budgen, uh, he in his video, he's he has experienced the same kind of a problem, and that's to me one of the saddest things about my my Christianity. <laughs> All right, um, shall we go on to the next one? Yeah. Okay. Galatians 2.21. I do not frustrate the grace of God. For if righteousness come by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. Very clear. And, you know, this is one of the top verses. This goes hand in hand with Galatians 2.16, which we've already covered. Uh, which comes five verses earlier, saying, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ. And it goes on from there. And then this verse, I do not frustrate the grace of God. So what that means, this, you know, to frustrate is to prevent something from succeeding or being fulfilled, uh, to do it intended purpose. Uh, so don't frustrate God's grace by trying to mix your puny works into it. 
uh, you know, if you do that, it's no longer grace, as it says it, you know, and if I grace, then it's no more worse, otherwise grace is no more grace, but if it's no worse, then it's no more grace, otherwise work is no more work. Um, I think that Romans 11, 6, so, um, so don't frustrate the grace of God by trying to mix works into it, because if righteousness come by the law, by you following the law, then Christ is dead in vain. And what's that? What's that mean? You know, that means in vain means it's pointless. You know, when you do something that's in vain, it's pointless. It's futile. So Christ, Jesus Christ, death, burial, and resurrection. If you're trying to mix your work and frustrate God's grace and what He did by sending His Son into the world to die for your sins and overcome death for you through his resurrection. And if you say, well, um, I accept Jesus as my Savior, but I don't want to also bit my words into it, then you're frustrating God's grace. It's no longer great. And you're making Christ's finished work in vain. Um, you know, it's the same thing as this repent of your sins for salvation heresy. I mean, that is the number one heresy in Christianity today, because it's taught in just about every church I hear. Um, but it's a contradiction. You, you're you turning from all your sins so that you can be forgiven all, of all your sins by what Jesus did. It doesn't even make any sense. It's like you're trying to, you know, do these whole remedies to get well with this terminal illness that you have sin. Before going to the healing position, that has the only elixir to cure you, and you're trying to do it yourself. So you don't have to repent of your sins. You have to acknowledge you're a sinner and need a savior. Because nobody's ever turned from all their sins, save Jesus Christ, who was sinless. But as mortal human beings, we'll never be able to completely uphold the law and turn from all of our sins. Uh, and that's what turning from sin, you know, turning from sin is basically not transgressing the law, which also means keeping the law. So if righteousness comes by that keeping of the law, then Christ is dead in vain. So don't mix the two. Um, and this, you know, the end of Galatians 2 is a great way to try to show this, even though people still uh, read these verses, say, I agree with you, shake their head, and then, you know, a few days later, you go soul winning, and all of a sudden, repent of your sins comes out right out of their mouth when they're giving the gospel. Um, so it's something that, you know, we just got to keep hammering out and make sure that people understand um, this repent of your sins is the word repent has been hijacked in modern vernacular and has been twisted into something that it was never meant to mean in the Bible. It, in the in the Bible, it's just to change your mind or turn from something or turn to something. It was never intended to have this meaning of turning from sin uh, ever. You know, God repented more than any body else in the Bible. Uh, in the King James Bible, I think over three dozen times, God repents of something. And God has no sin, as we know. He wasn't repenting of sin. Uh, he, was, he was doing something, but in response to man or a group of people's actions, based on their actions, he turned from doing one thing and did another. He repented of that, um, of what he was going to do. Um, so that's that's what this verse teaches to me more than anything. It's just really showing that distinction between grace through faith and works of the law uh, being entirely um, opposite of each other. Yeah, there uh, there is a verse too that says that uh, you know uh, grace and and uh, law cannot uh, be combined. Uh, 
and they they uh, they repel each other. Really, they can't be mixed. It's oil and water, I guess. But the the the, the theme, of course, of this whole series um, is that well, we're 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 saved by faith alone in Christ alone, without any religious works required on our part. And so the last verses we were talking about uh, that c c concept of uh, faith and and is is what we do and uh, grace is what God does and works are not our works have no effect it's the work that God did on our behalf so that that pretty much covered the theme and and in this verse here this has always been one of my favorite verses too uh, that to make this point but it it says I do not frustrate the grace of God now. I don't, I don't know if God actually ever could feel frustrated, but uh, uh, I think Jesus kind of expressed uh, frustration with, uh, with uh, mankind uh, in, in some of the things he said. Uh, uh, that he, but frustration, as you said, uh, um, well, look at, if I look at the Amplified and how it expresses, it says, I do not ignore or nullify the grace of God. So um, nullify or, or means to cancel it out. So in other words, Paul says grace is no more grace. And that's what that's what this uh, this is point is being making is that um, if you think that your works are factor into your salvation in any way, then you've canceled out the grace of God. It's no, not grace at all. And that, uh, you know, it also says, if righteousness come by the law. Now, righteousness, uh, being righteous, means right standing. You're in good standing before God. God says, okay, good, you're good for heaven. You're good to go. Come on in. Uh, you get to have eternal life. You get to go to heaven. Uh, that's, you're deemed righteous. You're acceptable. Uh, so it says, if righteousness comes by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. And, and, and the Amplified, it, it expresses it like this. I do not ignore or nullify the gracious gift of the grace of God, his amazing unmerited favor. For if righteousness comes through observing the law, then Christ died needlessly. His suffering and death would have had no purpose whatsoever. Uh, I don't know uh, if anybody could read verses like this one and so many others that we've uh, discussed in this study here uh, and and not get it. Um, I guess it just has to be spiritual blindness or uh, it, it is so obvious. Uh, so to the viewer, if you continue to hold on to this idea that your contribution to salvation is necessary, that you've got to be religious, you've got to repent of your sins, you've got to change your life. If you do that, then you're just uh, frustrating the grace of God. You're nullifying it. You're canceling it out. And you're, you're basically um, making the point, as it says here in this verse, is that Christ died for nothing. He serves no purpose. His death on the cross for our sins really serves no purpose at all. All right, brother, more, more thoughts on this? Um, yeah, just, uh, I guess just uh, the righteousness, you know, if it doesn't come by the law, then what does it come by? Obviously, uh, as it says several times in the Bible, that God imputes his righteousness onto us by faith through Jesus Christ. So he is not the display of the perfect in righteousness in that we're going to lead a sinless life after we put our faith in Jesus Christ or and we're walking around, you know, justified and sanctified in this flesh, but we're declared justified and righteous and sanctified positionally through faith because we received God's perfect righteousness, His perfect holiness. That's what we received. We received His promise. Um, you know, that's what, um, that's what the gospel is, you know? 
You know, I mentioned earlier about, uh, you know, does God get frustrated? Um, you know, I, I, am, I shouldn't even compare myself to God in any way. Uh, my intelligence, knowledge, my understanding, my everything is just, it's just nothing compared to God. Um, so I don't really, you know, I can't really comprehend, I can't begin to uh, pretend that I can represent how God feels about this. I can only imagine. Maybe he's not phased by it. Maybe he's, God is not frustrated. I don't know. All I know is that as a, as a, a person who loves Jesus and appreciates so much what he's done for me and for the world, that I feel frustrated. I even feel even like sick and I hate to say it, I mean like angry when people persist in in uh, arguing against free gift theology and, and, and insisting that what Jesus did on the cross is insufficient. It wasn't enough. And again, I can't, I can't say how God feels about that. But for me, it's heartbreaking. And it, it just it makes me sick and even angry that someone could uh, feel that way. And then when they teach that, uh, it's bad enough that that's how they feel. But when they start uh, promulgating that idea and, and teaching it, it's just, it's hard for me to take, brother. I just, I get so, so upset about it. And it, and so, I don't know, maybe God was not phased by it. I don't know. What do you think? Yeah, I think a lot of people simply are just a little unlearned and haven't thought God enough to come to the acknowledgement of the truth. And, you know, they're ignorant of these things, but... But if hopefully you explain it to them and they're they want to the heart, they're willing to receive the good news and, and you go through the gospel and explain it to them that they'll receive it and see that they were in error of thinking that, you know, there was any of their own goodness or, or works or deeds that were part of salvation and, and that error is corrected and they receive the true gospel. Um, so hopefully that is a lot of people out there who have just not come to the acknowledgement of the truth. But I agree with you and the people that have had the knowledge of the truth but have frustrated 
frustrated the grace of God and are mixed in their own righteousness to the point where they are teaching a worse faith salvation and you show them the clear gospel or you make a video showing that the gospel message is a free gift and is received by faith alone and they will blast your comment session with all the self-righteous you know, you have to live a righteous life and look at my changed life and uh, you don't have a changed life like mine and that proves you're not saved and that, are you saying it gives you a license to sin? Then, yeah, I get very frustrated with that because they, you, you show them the true gospel, they just rejected it. Uh, they rejected the true gospel and are coming hard against it and, you know, Crucifying um, the Son of God afresh every time they think that any part of their own works and merit have anything to do with salvation. Um, you know, and I look at it as they're either really, really, really confused on this, um, and at one point may have trusted in the gospel, but not, but now have heard too many false gospels and false prophets and become sort of indoctrinated and mixed up in it, or they simply have never received the, the true gospel message and they're unregenerated. And, uh, you know, I try to give grace to everybody um, and say, well, you know, obviously we don't know for sure um, who has received uh, the free gift through faith alone and has been regenerated and who not. But it's not like I'm hard again. The, you know, the true gospel of Jesus Christ and are arguing and angry about it and trying to show all these works and you show them scripture and they're spiritually blind to it and they don't have any discernment, then that tells me that they don't have the Holy Spirit guiding them into understanding of the scriptures because they're unregenerate. Um, so that's that's kind of my thoughts. Hopefully, hopefully most people are just ignorant of it. You know, they've heard the repent of your sins in their local church, and oh, that's a part of it that I'm really not sure. And then you show them the true gospel, and that, oh, that makes sense. Yeah, I knew it wasn't anything I do. I knew it was a free gift, but you know, I wasn't sure because the local church told me I had to repent of my sins and and make Jesus the Lord of my life for salvation. But I know I couldn't do it. I know I could never be perfect, and I needed him and what he did for me. You know, you can get a lot of people cleared up on that um, because they have they have a humble heart, and they are seeking God. Um, and then God puts somebody in their pathway to tell them the true gospel, and they receive it. But the people that have the true gospel put in, you know, put in front of them or on the video and come hard against it uh, repeatedly, even when you try to patiently and as meekly as you can go through it with them and say, look, this is, you know, this is where I think you're in error of what you're, what you're doing is sort of missing the discipleship with what Jesus Christ did for you for salvation. Don't mix the two. If they come hard against it, then, yeah, I think they're, they're trusting and establishing in their own righteousness that they're not uh, committed to the righteousness of God. Yeah. One of the things that I've struggled with uh, for many years is um, trying to discern with uh, when I should patiently continue with someone, uh, tr trying to, you know, convince them. Um, and when is the right time to dust off my feet? and move on. And Jesus did tell us that don't cast our pearls to the swine. Uh, it, 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 we, we should be able to, uh, well, we have to be able to make a decision about, uh, uh, okay, conversation is over with this person. Uh, maybe we'll talk again in five years or, you know, or, or maybe they'll come across another person that maybe the chemistry, the personalities, or maybe something will change in their life so that they're, they're ready to actually listen. But right now, I have to just uh, make a judgment. 
that my, my, my time is better spent finding someone else, perhaps who, who does have ears to hear. And, and trying to make that judgment has is, is always been a little tricky thing for me because uh, I don't want to just throw in the towel on people too quickly. But um, So uh, uh, I guess now I have to make the decision, should I go to Romans 3.20 now? Are we finished? <laughs> finished with that one? Yeah, we can go on. All right. Okay, Romans 3.20. Therefore... By the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. Again, showing that there's no justification in the sight of God by following the law and keeping the law. Um, the, the law was to show that we're sinners, you know, to give us knowledge of our sinful ways. And then we come to that humble, you know, sort of moment where we say, okay, there's nothing that we can do in this flesh. It's hard and as hard as we try and labor to keep the law. Um, and therefore, Hopefully, in the right fashion, the law is used properly as a schoolmaster to get us to cry. Um, going back to, so that's, you know, that's sort of the, the gist of verse 20. Um, just looking back at verse 19 and what we were just talking about. Um, verse 19 says, now we know that what things soever the law saith, it saith to them who are under the law that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. So here's my thoughts on that in somebody who is contending with the true gospel of Jesus Christ that it's, by, that it's a free gift received by faith and not anything that we do. And it's not anything that we do to prove we're saved or to keep our salvation that no works of the law justifies at all. But if somebody says that, oh, yes, they do, uh, that's a part of it, too. You know, Jesus made a way for us to, for salvation, but we can't just do whatever we want and have a life. Then we have to, you know, show that we've received the faith, and true faith is by, by having a changed life and doing all these religious works and doing these good deeds and not sinning and stop sinning and all this. And they're concentrating on the law. And I got to stop sinning and I can't do this and this and this and you can't either. What that tells me is they're still under the law. As it says in verse 19, because the law is still talking to them. So they're still under the law. Um, they have a book come guilty before God because they they think they can keep it, and so it's ne it hasn't it hasn't got them to place their faith in Jesus Christ alone for salvation, um, and so that's sort of my thoughts with both of those passages together. Is if you can't see that you know keeping the law, repenting of your sins, all that stuff doesn't justify you in Galatians 2.21, which we just saw in now in Romans 3.20, then it's probably because you're still under the law, as it says in verse 19. Um, so that's my thoughts on that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, the, the first word of this verse, therefore, uh, that begs the question is, well, what was said earlier to that now he's saying therefore, because everything else was leading up to this conclusion. And the conclusion uh, of all the preceding verses is this statement here, uh, that, that no one can be justified uh, in, in God's sight. God will never look at you and say, yep, you're good enough. You can come to heaven because of your goodness. Uh, uh, God will never say that to anybody. Uh, 
be, because they were able to be religious and be good enough, okay? Uh, but then it says, by the law is the knowledge of sin. So as we've said this numerous times before, but uh, Jesus taught that, uh, uh, I, I like to call them the impossible sayings of Jesus, right? Where, where Jesus is making all these impossible demands on everybody. And finally, the apostles were are just like frustrated, throw up their hands and say, well, gosh, based on everything you've been saying here, uh, how is it possible for anyone to be saved? Because Jesus was making it seem like, hey, it's impossible. Even every little thought, you don't think you've murdered anybody, but if you hated someone, you're, you're, you're guilty of murder because even your thoughts are judged that severely. So they had to conclude that, wait, it's impossible. And, and Paul said that the same thing in here in another verse, he, he says that by the law is the knowledge of sin. Paul says that by the law, it, we, we learn about sin. It, it's our schoolmaster to teach us that it's futile. It's impossible to get saved by following the law because the standard is perfection. And, and so Jesus and Paul both are making this point that it's important you realize that uh, it's impossible for you to earn your salvation. And therefore, do you understand now that you need to be saved? You need a savior. <laughs> you can't do it. Now, I want you to understand the helplessness of your situation, the hopelessness of your situation. And now cry out to God as the... Uh, you had the Pharisee and the, ta the tax, collect tax collector. The Pharisee boasted about all his good works, and the tax collector just said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. He recognized the impossibility of pleading his case, of his good works to God, and he just got, uh, pleaded to God for mercy and admitted he's a sinner, and he needed God to save him. And so that's the conclusion that I came to, that you came to, that everybody who ever got saved came to the same conclusion. It's impossible, but thank you, Jesus. You, you provide salvation to us. You did it. And it is possible. Salvation is possible, but only through faith in you. Judge not, and you shall not 
be judged, condemn not, and ye shall not be condemned, forgive, and ye shall be forgiven. But what he's really saying is you can't not judge. Therefore, you're going to be judged. You can't not condemn. Because the law's written on your heart, you use it every day to condemn others. Therefore, you're you're in condemnation. And you can't forgive everybody. Only I can do that. So you need to put your faith in me to be forgiven. So, you know, people will teach these, you know, use these verses to teach how you should be hypocritical as a believer, you know. But really it's talking about Jesus is giving impossibilities to unbelievers to point them that a few will try to do it themselves. And that they're under condemnation by keeping the words of the law because they're never going to do it perfectly. And they need him. Only he can forgive them. Only he can, you know, he didn't come to condemn the world or to save the world. Uh, but you have to go through Jesus Christ and put your faith in him in order to not be condemned, to not be judged, to be forgiven. That's what he's saying in all these verses. Um, so these impossibility verses, I think if we just went through it all and made a list, and then, you know, or, or found the list that somebody has already made, we should come up with a lot, a lot more probably to add to it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that video you made um, about uh, hypocrisy was, uh, that just blew me away. Uh, you, the way you taught on that was just a, a great revelation that I've never heard anybody explain it uh, as well as you did. Um, maybe if you, if you, uh, can remember uh, once this video is uploaded, maybe you could post the name and link uh, to that video so people can watch that because it was really fantastic. Um, I guess, um, Lord brother, time just flies by. It's it's already been uh, uh, an hour and seven minutes, and you know we're we're trying to keep these approximately an hour, um, but just boy. Time flies by when you're having fun talking about Jesus, huh? Amen. <laughs> we only got through three verses. Yeah. That, that was the fastest hour and seven minutes we've had. Yeah. Uh, that, that really flew by. Well, maybe you can make it an hour and ten minutes by just taking a couple minutes now to kind of uh, summarize the study. All right. I'll make it short and sweet. Uh, the three verses that are the three passages that we looked and today really make a point of distinguishing not being justified, not being declared righteous by anything that we do by the, by the works of the law, but only through faith in Jesus Christ, by putting our faith, resting in his finished work, um, trusting in his promise, that is the only way that we can have perfect righteousness imputed onto our account to be declared uh, justified in the sight of God, uh, not by anything that we do. And this study really hammered that home tonight. Mm -hmm. Okay, brother. Um, thanks again for joining me. I really enjoy these conversations and I, I'm very hopeful that uh, some people will uh, well, they'll be enlightened, and they will get it. Um, and for those people who already understand this and, and believe correctly, then I'm hopeful then that maybe these videos will be used by them to share with others who don't yet understand this, this free gift salvation. So uh, to the viewers, uh, thank you for watching, and bless you all in the name of our great Savior God, Jesus.